right, welcome everyone to Naturalist Nights at Hallam Lake. Uh, tonight we're very honored to have Andre Willie here. Now we do these every week. We do them Wednesdays at Third Street Center in Carbondale and Thursdays here at Hallam Lake. Uh, next week we have a really interesting presentation on wilderness and peril overuse in the Snowmass and Maroon Bells Wilderness, an issue that I know is close to many of our hearts. Uh, this week we do have Andre Willie here. I know that he does not need much of an introduction as a lot of you already know him well. He's a longtime resident of Aspen. Um, he's very familiar with Hallam Lake. His family used to raise animals down here before it was connected with ACEs, so he knows the area quite well. <laughs> is a very respectable naturalist. Uh, he is also a teacher at Aspen High School of Science. And tonight he's going to tell us about an amazing opportunity that he had with a program called Polar Trek, which pairs up scientists with teachers uh, to do research together. Now before we start, I just want to mention our partnership that we have with the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, ourselves, uh, the Roaring Fork Audubon Society, and Wilderness Workshop. We also have a variety of sponsors that make this available to you, the public, uh, as well as help let us film this. You'll see in the back we are filming this, and we will have this on our YouTube channel. Finally, our special sponsor tonight is Euclid House Bed and Breakfast, so keep them in mind next time you want a nice, relaxing weekend. So without further ado, uh, please help me in welcoming Andre Willing. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, it's great to be down here. I got my start uh, actually feeding the geese out there for Elizabeth Pepke back in the day when I was about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the last time I came and presented here was after coming back from Antarctica and going down to the, to the southern hemisphere. And now I got a chance to go to the northern hemisphere, so I'm bipolar now, so <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> but um, we're going to take a look at the extremes of life in the Arctic today. And um, I did get um, into this program called Polar Trek. And um, last summer, I was able to travel up to the Arctic and work with a team of scientists uh, that were studying Arctic ground squirrels and uh, looking at the circadian rhythms of these Arctic ground squirrels, which I found to be pretty amazing. You'll find out a lot about uh, Arctic ground squirrels today. Also, now I'm a squirrel whisperer. Um, <laughs> but along the way, I uh, saw a lot of really neat things, um, a lot of neat wildlife and great experiences that I want to share with you tonight also. So anyway, we went up to this place called Tulik. And uh, let me see if I can get the, uh, nope. I've got a little, you can see where it is on there. But we're going to head north to the Brooks Range. Got my little pointer there. Um, but the Brooks Range kind of goes across the northern part of Alaska. To get there, we had to drive from Fairbanks, which is right about in here, about a three or 400 mile drive, depending on exactly where we went. Ultimately, went up to Prudhoe Bay at the very tip there in the Arctic Ocean, which was quite an experience. Um, to get there is, is a, an amazing trip. It's, it's on a drive. It's the ice road that you hear about in the ice road truckers. So if you've ever watched that. <laughs> um, it's open year round, uh, even in the winter, and it's dirt, it's not paved. And it's, it's quite a, an experience driving up the ice road, especially with all the heavy trucks that basically run support up to Prudhoe Bay to keep the Alaska pipeline here. Uh, usually I have a little uh, cursor that uh, shows with this, but it's not working. But the pipeline there traverses you know, all the way from the Arctic Ocean down to Valdez about 1,000 miles long, and the road kind of parallels the pipeline the entire way. Um, but along the way, we saw some wildlife moose in the taiga there, the moose and spruce biome. Uh, that's the uh, Brooks Range. There's a pass called Attigan Pass where you drive over the Brooks Range. That was pretty impressive. And then in the lower left is our field site, um, which is right adjacent to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So as you're most of you are probably aware, uh, President Obama, Obama just... Uh, recommended uh, wilderness designation for ANWR. And so you'll get a chance to see some of the scenery, some of the wildlife there, and it's a pretty awesome place. You know, it's been said that it's a desolate wasteland by some, but it's hardly that. So anyway, along the way, we gotta go across the Arctic Circle. That was a first for me, so. Um, this is in May, yep. And uh, the mosquitoes were getting pretty bad down south here at the Arctic Circle. When we went further north, they weren't too bad, but I had my full bug suit on. Um, 
when it's bad, you need to wear gloves too. This was just for taking some pictures. And then we jumped back in the car and got out of there. Uh, but when we actually got up to our working area, which is a place called Tulik Field Station, uh, you can see it's still pretty frozen. We're still kind of just coming out of winter. And uh, this is a lake, Tulik Lake here, and it's frozen over pretty well, but it's just starting to thaw out. And this is actually the, uh, the dock there with the boats and canoes and whatnot. Um, our quarters were very comfortable. I was pretty psyched when I got my own little tent here. I shared the other half of it with another scientist, but uh, very comfortable. It was pretty awesome. Um, mainly that's because I was lucky I got there fairly early. Um, we had these guys right out the front door, so it was still quiet in camp. There weren't a lot of people there initially, and so the wildlife would come right in. Um, eventually, though, there was about 100 people uh, working out of Tulik, uh, scientists from all over the world, and looking at everything you can imagine that might be relevant to polar research. There was chemists and atmospheric chemists and biologists and geologists and hydrologists and we all ate uh, meals together, so it was a great opportunity to sit down and talk to the world experts on, you know, Arctic and polar sciences. So it was amazing. Um, the land of the midnight sun also was pretty incredible too. This is this is midnight actually. Uh, the sun's behind the clouds; so it's not too bright, but it's still pretty high in the sky. And then, you know, during the the course of the the night, the sun just kind of goes around and around and comes back. <laughs> It goes around in circles, never goes down. So, I mean, you hear about that, but to experience it is, is pretty awesome. Um, and it kind of energizes you. It's like sleep when you get old, you know. You don't need to, you don't need to. Uh, we worked hard, but when we got done working, we'd go out and go on these amazing hikes. They had bikes there, and you could go out and just uh, explore. And that's when I did a lot of my photography. But. Um, some of the science that's going on up there is pretty amazing. Um, this is actually a group of students. As a teacher, I kind of appreciated that some kids from Fairbanks were able to come up here and see this. Um, the girl here, Marley, uh, is a graduate student, and in her hand is a probe to uh, detect the depth of the permafrost. So you just take that big probe and poke it in the soil, and um, it's part of a long-term ecological monitoring project to kind of see what the permafrost is doing and they're finding that it's slowly melting, or maybe not that slowly in places. But it's, they've been monitoring it for, for quite some time. Um, I haven't actually seen the data on that, but um, pretty interesting project. Um, when that permafrost melts, oop, um, of course it releases greenhouse gases. Um, and this is a way to measure the carbon dioxide and methane that's given off by the tundra. So you imagine that soil and that permafrost has been frozen for at least 20,000 years. Wow. And you know, since the last ice age, um, and probably even longer than that. Um, the last time that it was really warm, when there weren't any ice ages, um, significantly warm was more like 65,000 years ago. So all the carbon from all the organic material is still locked up in there. And it's um, said that they estimate that the, the polar regions hold about twice the amount of carbon that's currently in our atmosphere. So let's keep it in the frozen in the permafrost as, as much as possible. But this is kind of a neat um, system. Uh, this guy is from University of Michigan, and uh, he's out there kind of setting it up. This is the computer brain that controls it, and these are robotic devices. And uh, they have these arms that kind of close this chamber that seals off a little volume of permafrost and then measures the, the gases that are coming out of it. And once they get it all automated, they can just leave it there for the duration of the year. They have to have somebody maybe check on it every now and then, but it saves a lot of manpower because you don't have to be there day in and day out to check it. So it's a pretty interesting experiment. Um, this is an older version of a similar idea, you know, looking at greenhouse conditions and what do the plants do up in the Arctic. And this has been up for many years. I'm not sure how long it took to for these dwarf willows to reach six or eight feet tall. But everything around there, the willows are more like, you know, 16, 18 inches. Um, so lots of science going on. Incredible to, to see some of this stuff. This is a group that was looking at migratory songbirds, kind of looking at the timing of migrations when the birds were coming up there, when they were leaving, um, their nesting success, the survivorship, uh, a whole bunch of different um, related topics. 
but they shared our lab space, so I became pretty good friends with them as a birder. So I got to go out with them one day, and uh, oh, let's see if we can go out and look for some white crowned sparrows nesting. Not an easy task. They just nest in the grass. After and an just hour or walk so of through. getting skunked, we finally located this nest. Oh, I got a flush right here. So they're just in the shrubbery. I found it right here. And, we have and then once you get right near it, it's really clothes. hard to find the actual nest. Awesome. Cool. So you can see down there, little mouth open. <laughs> a couple little mouths open. Oh. <laughs> so when they heard all the wrestling around, they thought that mommy was coming to feed them. And uh, uh, so we just we documented them, <laughs> Team Bird. We documented them and then got out of there so that the um, parents could come back and, and take care of them. But then that nest, nest site was tagged, and it's a pretty interesting project. They um, have GoPros, GoPro science. So you put a GoPro on the nest, and you can control your GoPro from your, your iPhone, and you don't even have to come up to it, and you can see everything that's going on. So their team had, they got 10 GoPros sent to them while I was there, and they were putting them out on these nests, so we were trying to locate the nest. A lot of fun. A lot of the research has to do with phenology, uh, and that's just the timing of these biological, not necessarily just biological events, I guess, but the timing of the seasons and the timing of some of these events. So, you know, when do the flowers come out? When does the green up occur, the bud burst? Uh, when do the caribou migrate through? I found these sheds just walking around out there and nice huge caribou sheds. I wanted to bring them back so we could have them here in Aces, but I would have had to pay a couple hundred bucks for shipping. But uh, anyway, um, so they've been monitoring this phenology in lots of different aspects. Um, this just shows a few, uh, and these aren't really very long-term data sets. They come from around 2000 or even 2006. But over time, these might become valuable because we can kind of track changes. Um, the freeze-thaw of the lake hasn't changed a lot in the last decade. You know, there's anomalies, different years. The green up peak and to the peak of fall colors. Arctic ground squirrel sightings. When did they first come out of the burrow? Uh, kind of like Groundhog's Day. When is that? Is that like coming up <laughs> soon? But when they, you know, poke their head out of, the, out of their burrows, and when do they go back into migration? So this is a neat project, and as a teacher, um, something that the kids can relate to pretty well, and we're actually doing a similar thing here locally, looking at phenology, and I know ACES is very into the timing of these things that occur right here in the Roaring Fork Valley, so it's kind of fun. So anyway, the title of this talk is Adapting to Extremes. What, what do you do if you live up in the Arctic, in this place where it's dark all winter and uh, you know, 24 hours of darkness for a good part of it, and 50, 60 below zero, uh, hardly anything to eat? What would you do? Hibernate. Hibernate? Migrate. No way. Migrate. South America. <laughs> Get the heck out of there. Uh, yeah, so you can migrate, and a lot of animals definitely migrate. They just, if they can get out of there, that's what they do. If they can fly, most of them, there's, there's one bird that doesn't fly away, but um, migrate is a good strategy. Um, hibernate's another pretty good strategy, though. Just fatten up and sleep it off and wait till it gets nice again. Wait till the times are good, you know, and there's food available. Um, and then there's another strategy, too. And uh, let's see, uh, well, I won't pick on anybody here, but you could just tough it out, right? Deal with it. Deal with the 24 hours of darkness, 60 below, 100 mile an hour winds, nothing to eat, and just, just buck it up and deal. So anyway, the migrators, you've got your, your caribou, and this is the porcupine caribou herd that is in this part of Alaska. And they migrate, I didn't know this until recently, they are the biggest land migrators on earth or the Alaskan caribou, uh, 1,500 miles um, to the calving grounds up in Anwar. And they migrate kind of from the boreal forest in the Yukon and um, central Alaska, migrate up to the Arctic plain um, where there's maybe some oil. Um, there's the pipeline. Uh, it's about 30% full of oil coming out of Prudhoe Bay. And uh, 
luckily, they, when they built the pipeline in the 70s, they were pretty conscious of caribou. Um, I mean, it's a huge resource, 170,000 animals approximately right now. And um, so it is built uh, up fairly high so that caribou can migrate under it. That was a big consideration. And it's also raised up off the ground so that the permafrost doesn't buckle and cause an oil spill on the tundra, which would be a disaster. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. Um, but we were right along that pipeline the whole way, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, some of the caribou don't make it in migration. So I found some nice sheds and, and some skulls. This was probably predated on. It had definitely been chewed on by wolves. Um, who knows how it died, but um, it's kind of neat to find. Some impressive birds, and this is kind of the iconic bird of the, icon, of the, uh, of the Arctic. Um, they're awesome, the loon. Um, the loonies. So I was sleeping when I first got there, and I started hearing the loon calls. And that's when I knew I'd arrived. You know, well, I'm really in the Arctic now. These loons coming, and they, they just kind of had migrated in right when I had gotten there. And, uh, okay. <laughs> and they set up their little territory on, on Tulik Lake right out in front of our camp. And uh, every day we'd see them out there. So it's pretty awesome. Um, we'd go out on the lake. Um, this is like 11 p.m. or something. And uh, we'd go out for a little canoe paddle on the lake. And one time we're out there, let's see, and the ice started moving around and it made this really weird noise of all the jingling of the ice so we got in the canoe and went out to investigate just to be out there with this ice flow amazing you know you think the ice would just melt but it turns into these they call it candle ice it's like a broken chandelier or something but then the loon came right up to us so we're just sitting in the canoe, and this loon's just kind of cruising around and checking us out. So it was awesome. I mean, I saw the loon that, got, that showed up here at Helm Lake last winter that got lost during migration. But it didn't have the breeding plumage, and I mean, they're, they're amazing. So I was pretty psyched. Did they dive? Yeah, they're diving. They're, so it was diving right there, fishing. They're fishing. Um, they're not a duck, but um, so it's pretty neat. Oop. This is another special bird. This is the, what I call the karaoke bird. It's a mimic, and so it imitates other birds, um, kind of like a mockingbird, or for the younger set in here, like the mocking jay. Right? The mocking jay can imitate anything, <laughs> um, but these guys they they can mimic. They mimic mimic machines and other weird sounds, not even other birds. And um, I went out with a guy, I didn't take this picture, a guy named Seth took it, he was the naturalist up at Tulik, and he had this big telephoto lens, and when we saw this bird, it flew up close to us, and he whipped out this lens and got a nice shot of it. But it's a special bird because it's normally only found in Asia, and its range, basically, in North America, this is the extent of it, right up in the very, very tip of the north slope of Alaska. And so, when we were out in the field, these people would drive up in their RVs and come over to us, have you seen any blue throats? And they had driven all the way up 300 miles from Fairbanks just to see the blue throat. <laughs> and they're camped out and it's like, you know, really cold and gnarly out. Um, and this is another interesting bird. This is a redneck phalarope, which will migrate through Colorado. Um, really cute little bird, but they practice an unusual mating strategy called polyandry. And um, polyandrous birds, basically, this is a female here, and they'll swim around in circles to attract a mate, and if they are successful, they'll, lay, they'll mate with it and, and lay eggs, but then they leave the eggs for the male to sit on. The male does all the sitting, the male does all the caring and nurturing of the little chicks, and guess what mom does? Mom, mom splits, and she goes and finds another mate sometimes, and lays another batch of eggs, and then leaves the other batch of eggs for the male and then, <laughs> then splits again. <laughs> That's not their job. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. Uh, now this bird is a little more like it. This is a tundra swan. Their mating strategy, a little more you know, conservative. 
they pretty much are uh, monogamous, mate for life, as long as the mate doesn't get killed or something. And they, they will come back to the same, um, the same lake each year. Let's hear one of them, if I can get this thing over there. Oh, nope. My little thing is not. Oh, and no, I spoiled it. There we go. Oh. There we go. So the tundra swan. Pretty much made for life, though. And there was a resident pair on our lake, so that was cool. I got this from the canoe. We just kind of slowly eased our way out close to it and didn't scare it off, so it was nice. Uh, this is another big migrator. This is, this is a record migrator, the American golden plover. And it goes from way up here in the Arctic, and then it does go down to South America for, for, for winter. It goes down to the Argentina Pampas down there. Beautiful bird. This one doesn't migrate, though. The ptarmigan is a survivor. They're, they got to be the toughest birds anywhere. And that's their call. <laughs> that's their little mating call. That's a male sitting up on the rock and calling for a female. Very strange. And I got a chance to watch this guy. Ptarmigan are great to photograph because they're not afraid of you. They think they're hiding and they're related to chickens, right? Galliforms, they're crowing. And of course, we've got ptarmigan here. This is the white-tailed ptarmigan from up on Pearl Pass that I took last winter skiing along and just about skied right over them. They're not afraid of you. They think they're camouflaged. When, when you're about to ski over them and they move, then you see them. Uh, but then it's easy to get some good photography, get some good photos, even if you just have your little iPhone or something. Um, doll sheep are up there. They live in one of the most extreme environments. Of course, we have bighorns here. You know, how do they survive up on these ridges of these mountains, like up on Highlands Ridge or something, and they never come down during the winter? What are they eating? They don't have hardly anything to eat. You know, there's some lichens and mosses and a little bit of grass they can dig up. I don't see how they get enough calories. Even they don't seem to store that much, but they are, they are tough. They're survivors. At least most of them, not this guy. <laughs> and then, of course, the muskox. They're the ultimate, I think, survivor of the Arctic. Um, active all winter. Those big shaggy coats. Remnants of the Pleistocene Ice Age. Um, and of course, those are mosquitoes and other flies swarming around them. So it's nice to have that so thick they hate skin. The summer, though. They probably hate the, the summer. They do. They all hate the summer. Yeah, I mean, the flies drive the them summer, crazy. Yeah. So they, they probably would prefer it to be the middle of winter, or at least the, the seasons. Yeah, sometimes they get those flies that go in their nose. Yeah. With the skin, they're protected in most of their body, but their nose and their eyes and their ears, they're pretty vulnerable. Um, Here's one in winter. And then you get the hibernators. Um, marmots are up in the Arctic as well as here, and uh, slightly different uh, species, but uh, living in kind of the rocky areas. And they are pretty good hibernators. Um, you get your bear, bears, grizzlies. Um, it's a young grizzly out hunting ground squirrels. This one here has actually got a ground squirrel in his mouth. <laughs> These two, we were in the car. I mean, this is we're on the road in the car, and they start running straight towards us. And it's like, why are they running straight towards us? Glad that we weren't outside. Um, but it was a male chasing another younger male, and they just ran right past the car and kept going. <laughs> they could care less. We were there. So uh, they're hibernators, of course. I was a little shaky there. There's a bear out the window, oh my god. <laughs> but the ultimate hibernator is the Arctic ground squirrel. These guys are amazing, uh, absolutely amazing. Look at how long their claws are. They're just these super long claws for digging and burrowing. Um, they pretty much eat you know, any vegetation here, they're eating some bog cranberries, 
a lot of blueberries and all these dwarf tundra bushes, but also the leaves and the buds and the roots and stems and everything. Um, so I was up there and I got to work with Team Squirrel. Uh, we had quite a group. Um, this project has been going on for over 20 years with different um, researchers. It's led by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and, and um, Anchorage also. Um, the principal investigator is this man, Corey Williams, here. And he's um, a postdoctoral researcher. And with the team, we had an undergraduate student here, Victor, from University of Chicago. We had Kate, who's a PhD student at Berkeley. And um, Jeanette, who works up at University of Alaska Fairbanks as a research technician. And then I was lucky to left to come along and as a polar track teacher, as a K-12 teacher. My job was kind of to bring this research experience and some of the science that's taken place up in the Arctic, bring it back to K-12 students and to the public, to you guys. So um, they needed a lot of help. Uh, it's a lot of work to, to get the research done, and so lots of hands on deck. Um, and we were pretty busy. So why ground squirrels? Well, they are they're amazing. They're absolutely amazing. They, as a mammal, can cool off to negative 2.9 degrees which is colder than any other mammal, um, significantly colder. You know, it's colder than an ice cube. And um, when they hibernate, they do so for up to nine months of the year, seven to nine months. Um, but they don't seem to lose hardly any body mass, a little bit for sure, but they don't lose any, um, <coughs> their muscles don't atrophy and their bone density doesn't change. And they basically metabolize this um, stuff called brown fat, which is a special tissue that hibernators use. And, and it's pretty remarkable. They can spend nine months doing that. They also have this circadian clock that is perfect like a metronome. And um, that's unlike any other Arctic animals. Other Arctic mammals pretty much free run and are active whenever, 24 hours a day with the sun. Um, the caribou could be grazing at any time. The ptarmigan are out at any time. They sleep when they're tired and, you know, there's not like a, a time. But these guys follow a very strict circadian rhythm. And uh, one of my, is it, is it alive? <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. When you hold that, it's like holding an ice cube that has fur on it, literally. And one of my students, I didn't even know they knew what a tribble was. Does anybody know what a tribble is? Star Trek. Star Trek, yeah. Tribbles look just like they're, they're little fur balls that reproduce like rabbits or worse. <laughs> But, uh, but the technology has kind of driven the, the current research. And um, they've got these miniaturized eye buttons. Everything's eye something. Um, and it's a body temperature logger. And you can swallow one of these and monitor your own body temperature if you want. They've done that with mountain climbers up on Mount Everest to kind of monitor human um, activity. With these guys, they were implanted. Um, under the skin and the abdomen, and they have this little body temperature logger that basically measures their body temperature about every hour for an entire year, 365 days, or a year and a half even. Um, and they store all that data, and then you have to retrieve the data. They'll probably have it on Bluetooth soon, but not yet. So we have to go back and, and um, explant the, the little temperature logger. Let me show you what we get from that, though. Um, I'm getting pretty good with this. This is what the data set likes. We get a little science into this, into the naturalist night. Yeah, nice spreadsheet, yeah. Um, but what's special about this spreadsheet is the number of data points that we've got on there. Let me scroll all the way down. There's 4,000 something temperatures that are listed there. That doesn't mean a whole lot. One of my jobs here as a teacher is, is to bring this back to kids, so I have them graph it and take a look at what does that mean. So this is what the graph looks like. And um, it's a pretty unique graph. Uh, it's doing kind of some neat things there. Uh, the, the date, let me see if I can bring the date up a little bit so you can see when this is happening. Yeah, so in... Um, in the summertime, in July, the body temperature is up here, and it fluctuates about two or three degrees every day. At night, it goes down. In the morning, in the, in the daytime, it goes up. When they actually go into hibernation in August, it takes a dip 
down close to zero. And then if you notice about every 14 days, every two weeks or so, it spikes again and goes back up. My little pointer's dying. Um, goes back almost to normal, but only for a few hours. Then it drops back down, goes along. Um, and so why, why does it do that? Why are they warming up? Um, and that's some of what we're trying to figure out. Um, yeah, why not just stay cold? Um, but we don't really know. Um, yeah, see if it's warmed up. Now, they don't come out of their burrow and they don't fully wake up. Their body temperature comes up and they're still kind of asleep. A um, couple things might be going on here. And, and also, down below here, this is the soil temperature. And in about January or late December, it starts to really get cold, negative 10, approaching negative 20 in some years, down in the soil, in their burrow, about a meter down. Uh, their body temperature here is where it's dipped down to negative, almost negative 3. Um, one of the thoughts is that they've taken EEGs of their brain, and their brains are basically flatlined when they're that cold. Their brain activity is zero. Their heart rate is down to about two beats a minute, and their respirations are minimal, about two also. Um, but they think maybe that, you know, if your brain has, is inactive for that long, uh, it's probably not good. Mm -hmm. So they might rewarm to keep their neural pathways going, keep some brain activity going. Mm -hmm. Even when you're asleep, you've, you've got your REM sleep and you're dreaming, and your brain's very active when you're sleeping. So if your brain's flatlined for too long, it um, might not be a good thing. That's one possibility. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really know. That's ongoing research. So it's Pretty interesting, the, the, the data that we're able to get with the little eye buttons. This graph here just shows male versus female, and you can see the difference in the timing of their hibernation. So the males, um, male down here, it's much narrower time when they're, this is the hibernation period, and this is when they're actually active. Females spend an extra month or two in the burrow hibernating. Um, but it's kind of crazy. Um, they stay hibernating until basically uh, May sometime. Um, actually, they're still in the burrow here. This is when they're um, lactating and um, basically feeding their babies. And then when they come out of the burrow is when this temperature finally goes up. Um, their summer's pretty short. They go back into hibernation here at the end of August. There's still a good month of summertime in the Arctic there, and the males are still active. For some reason, the females go back in the burrow and start it all over again. It's three months out and nine months in the, in the burrow. It's kind of crazy. Um, don't know exactly why. Might be a leftover from an ice age when they couldn't spend as much time out. Um, anyway, some interesting things. So there's some special stuff about these ground squirrels. Seven to nine months of hibernation, but they don't lose hardly any bone or muscle mass. Um, their body temperature goes below freezing. Their plasma in their blood should be frozen solid. Um, there's some experiments. You can take a water bottle, put it in your freezer, and leave it in there for an hour or two. If your freezer is like negative five or something, then you take the water bottle out, and if you just kind of poke it, the water will stay liquid for a time before it solidifies. But if you poke it when it's super cold, it'll just crystallize right before your eyes. Uh, or if you pour it out, it will pour out as slush. Try it. That's what should happen with these guys' blood plasma because it's colder than the point at which it would normally freeze. So it's kind of crazy, um, pretty amazing. They don't burn hardly en any energy. They don't take food down in the burrow to eat during hibernation like a, um, like a pica or something. Uh, so very, very efficient at hibernating. Very low metabolism, so it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is their circadian rhythm. Um, they have this timing where on a daily basis, they, f like clockwork, warm up and cool off. And that's what this graph here is showing. This is each day, and it only changes a couple of degrees. But in the, in the morning, their body temperature warms up. And then in the evening, it cools down and warms up and cools down. It follows this perfect pattern, and it's timed according to the day just, just perfectly. So that's one of the other things that we were looking at. And that was this past summer, the main goal of the research was to get a better handle on the circadian rhythm. It's kind of regulated by this master clock in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. 
And basically, when you see sunlight, it stimulates that part of your brain, and that's your clock. That's what keeps your clock. So when you go and get jet lag, if you fly somewhere, it's the SCN that gets off out of whack. Um, or when uh, daylight savings time comes and you got to go to work you know, an hour early or something. Um, that's what regulates it. So we're trying to understand how, this is, um, how these squirrels operate with their circadian rhythms. And to do that, it's, it's a pretty invasive study on the squirrels. Um, they have to do a lot. You know, they've got this little body temperature logger. They also have a little collar on them, a radio collar, that has a light logging device on it, a light logger. And that's what is being downloaded here is the data from this light logging collar. But they're getting some really useful information out of it. So um, pretty interesting um, stuff. This shows the light logger. Basically, when they're in the burrow, it's down here. And then when they come out of the burrow, all of a sudden they're exposed to the light. So on this day, they were out of the burrow for about eight, eight and a half hours. But what's remarkable about, remarkable about this graph is that it's like clockwork. At about 7 in the morning, they leave their burrow and they're active all day. And then they go to bed at about 8.30 at night. Even though the sun's still up, there's plenty of food out and the weather's beautiful. Um, back into the burrow and do it the next day, same time, same station. And they don't have this solar cue that we're used to. So why do they do this? What benefit of the, would it be for them? They're the only mammal in the Arctic that keeps a circadian rhythm. All the other ones just don't pay attention to it and they're just out whenever they want to. So we're trying to get a handle on that. So the main goal of, the, of my trip was to do this phase shift experiment. Um, what's the evolutionary benefit for maintaining the circadian rhythm despite the 24 hours of daylight? And um, the thought is Team Squirrel, we hope to find out. We think that it probably costs energy. Um, it's, a, it's an energy saving um, strategy for the squirrels. Um, but it's really hard to measure energy expense in an animal. So um, that was the goal of the experiment. But here's one of the squirrels with his, he's got his collar on, you can barely see it. And um, here's out trapping some of them. So we had to catch them and um, get the collar on them. And um, for the phase shift experiment, we kept some in captivity for about um, 14 days so that they were 12 hours out of sync with the environment. And then let them go and then basically see if, it, if um, they expended more energy than the other ones. The results are not in yet. It's going to take a couple years. <laughs> um, and that's part of it. There's multiple studies going on with this, but that was the, the main thing that we were involved in. They're easy to catch. You just put a carrot in the trap, and they love them. They're out there. Uh, we call them trap happy if they kept coming back into the traps, uh, even after they already had a collar. They didn't seem to mind too much. Um, pretty funny. <laughs> They're fun to work with, and we took good care of them. None of them got... You know, we didn't have any fatalities or mortality, but uh, it is a pretty invasive study. I'm aware of that, but oh. so let's see. Here's one running around. We could get this. Are the females huh. pregnant when they go into hibernate? Um, no. They mate in, in early spring. They don't even come out of the burrow in April. And then they stay in the burrow and they kind of go back to sleep and gestate and then... So it's not a yeah. gestation. So this guy's chowing down on the, on the spring bud burst. These dwarf birches are uh, just coming out and uh, they were feasting on them. Look how fast they eat. They just got their little hands and <laughs> chowing down. This is a female. He's got uh, pups in the burrow. So, uh, you know, they're mammals, so they're, they breastfeed and... Uh, Got to get lots of nutrition to go feed. They got like five or six pups down in the burrow, probably. Pretty fun to watch, though. They're they're amazing animals. They really um, to survive in this extreme of, a, of an environment and to make it work is pretty remarkable. And the tricks that they have up their sleeve are 
they're amazing and they might have some good applications for us. We could learn a thing or two probably from these squirrels, from their physiology. Um, you know, your sleep cycle, your physical activity, digestion, alertness, hormones, body temperature, all these things are circadian functions in our bodies. And it's a big area of neuroscience is trying to understand these circadian cycles. So if your circadian rhythm is disrupted, like if you're a shift worker, you work in the night shift somewhere every day, um, those individuals a lot of times have increased rates of heart disease and cancer. And uh, so there's some definite medical applications for this. A lot of our animal research on circadian rhythms is with mice and lab rats. Well, they're nocturnal animals and um, we're diurnal. So the ground squirrels, um, they might be a better model for, for study for this kind of stuff. A lot can be learned from them. And this, this last slide, these are some of my students. Uh, I try to get them out and let them experience some of the, the tundra You're right here in Colorado. This is up on, on top of Mount Harvard. And we had a little, we were actually on the top first, hanging out there. And then this goat came up to join us, and sat down next to us. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna sit down right there, really? And so we got our picture. But um, trying to bring some of the, the thrill of being out in the wilderness and seeing some of the wildlife and appreciating, you know, what we've got around here or anywhere um, is, is definitely trying, trying to bring it home. And uh, I'm gonna try and get an ACES naturalist to come with me next year on this. This is a high school experiential ed, experiential ed trip, um, but it's a neat program that we have. So to close out, I've got a little, uh, took some slides. Uh, I didn't take these, these were at the Tulick Field Station for the whole year, um, just from a, a camera there, you can get a little feel for how things change over the course of the year. These were all taken at noon, all right, lunchtime. It's still dark in January. It's about 20 below up there today. Checked on the website with the naturalist up there. Um, there's a small group that stays at Tulick all winter. Um, Billy, I, it'd be tough to be up there all winter. It's a long winter. Finally, we get a little spring thaw. We had about six inches of snow in July when I was there, but in general, it was very nice. Happy to answer any questions if anybody has some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to be filming this, of course, so all of that sound is recorded through the microphone. So if you don't mind raising your hand and I can come run it over to you, that would be great. Uh, you had one over here? Uh, that was great. Do you have any insight on their survival rate in terms of from season to season? And are they more so, you know, at, at risk of the uh, uh, the harsh environment or predation. Um, and I, I guess I'm bringing this full circle because I'm curious about their communication because um, mm -hmm. I know our local ground squirrels here have really elaborate communication to avoid predation. Yeah, I mean, they definitely, they're not as social as like prairie dog colonies. They're pretty individual, um, but they live in colonies nevertheless. And they definitely have a strategy, the males, are out watching and if there's a predator come, they give an alarm call that goes through the whole area and then everybody takes cover and the males usually stick out uh, the latest, the longest to kind of keep monitor things and they're definitely more vulnerable to predation. 
Um, I, in our research, we didn't really do any um, of that kind of study looking at, at mortality from predation and, and whatnot, or even seasonal mortality. But anecdotally, you know, some, some of the years that in the last couple of years, they had one particularly harsh year and um, the populations definitely took a dive. Um, but they weren't actually looking at the population at that time, so they don't have numbers, but yeah, yeah. That was great. Um, are there any other mammals on the planet that have any kind of similar uh, circadian? There probably animals? are. Um, you know, these um, Arctic ground squirrels are um, whole Arctic. They're in Siberia also. So, you know, it's going to be... Um, I'm not really aware of anything else that's quite like that. Now, marmot, um, they're actually doing a lot of research on the marmots up there also, and they are big time hibernators. Um, and the marmots that live here are, are, are hibernators. It'd be interesting to see their hibernation patterns here. Um, I'm not sure if anybody, somebody's probably doing work on that, um, but I'm not familiar with it. But, um, you know, like voles and some of the smaller mammals are active in the winter and they're just active under the snow in the subnivian. Um, and um, so, I don't know if there's anything else. As far as I know, they are the, the record holders for duration and for low temperatures. Um, so it's a pretty unique strategy. So you're a ground squirrel or any other hibernator and you're under the ground for nine months. <laughs> you're a meter down, you're a couple of meters, and there's a couple of meters of snow on top of that. Your heartbeat may be only two, meter, two beats a minute. But you mm -hmm. still got to breathe. What are they doing for oxygen? Is snow permeable enough? Yeah, they're getting their answers. apparently, and, and actually up there, there's surprisingly low snowpack. Um, it's only um, a couple of feet, usually. And, you know, it's blown around so much. Um, but the snow, you know, oxygen permeates pretty good through the snow, and um, apparently that's not an issue. They, they've got enough oxygen down in the burrows. And the burrows are not that deep, you know. A meter down isn't really that much. Uh, they can't go any deeper because of permafrost. And um, they'd probably go deeper if they could, just because it would be warmer. Um, but um, that's about as, as deep as they can go. So as far as I know, the oxygen issue isn't in the problem. I mean, they don't need a lot, and they're not putting out that much CO2. So it diffuses in and out probably pretty well. <laughs> Does anyone Thanks. have a final question for Andre? Right up here. Um, do they redig their burrows every year, or do they go back to them? They um, they reuse the burrows, so they'll find an optimal place with with good sand, good high quality sand to burrow into. They're definitely, and they like hillocks where the snow isn't going to bury them. They're not down in swales, um, so they're in exposed areas where the snow is not going to cover them so much. So they really have a preference for exactly what kind of an area they want to dig their burrows, and then they reuse the burrows for a long time. Those burrows have probably been used for generations, actually. So, you know, occasionally they might dig a new one, but um, for the most part, they're the same burrow. Good question. Excellent. Good thinking. Well, again, Andre, <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you all for coming and for your questions. Uh, please join us next week. All right. Thank you.